Welcome to the second session of the third Rehab Rehabilitation Research Symposium at the College of Medical Rehabilitation and Kasim University. Uh, my name is Dr. Faisal Hadefi. I'm the Vice Dean for Clinical Affairs, and I'll be serving you today as a moderator. Uh, next to me is Dr. Akram Hilmi. He's going to be the co-moderator for today. Uh, moving along with our session, I want you all to please welcome me, uh, Professor Majdi Ahmed Arafa. Professor Mejdi, uh, he's a professor of physical therapy for neurological and neuro neurosurgical disorders with a master's doctorate degree of physical therapy and neurorehabilitation, bachelor's degree of physical therapy, a faculty of physical therapy at Cairo University with extensive clinical practice over 32 years. Please do uh, welcome Dr. Mejdi Arafa. So Dr. Mejdi, you're gonna have uh, 15 minutes, uh, 10 minutes. We had, yes, we're gonna make it up to 15 minutes max and followed by five minutes uh, of questions. Thank you, doctor. stimulation and repetitive trans magnetic stimulation from the basic foundations of central stimulation is morphology of the brain it is very important to consider the morphology of the brain because the basic neurophysiological mechanism of central stimulation is called interhemispheric interaction. Interhemispheric action due to the combination of, of the both hemisphere do, the, through the corpus callosum. If lesion occur in one hemisphere, it will lead to lack of the cortical drive. Lack of the cortical drive in one hemisphere must be compensated in other side by increasing excitability. We can modulate all of this through, through central stimulation to decrease, increase the cortical drive of the lesional hemisphere and to decrease the, ex the excitability of the non-lesional hemisphere. This is one of the basic foundations of central stimulation. Also, Central stimulation can, can be applied in different levels, either cortical, subcortical, salamic, uh, cerebellar, even uh, cerebral, stim cerebral stimulation, and spinal cord stimulation. Also, the functional anatomy of the different areas of the brain must be considered. Of course, the effect will depend on the site of the stimulation. Actually, a lot of researches in this area lead to promising results for future neurorehabilitation. Even in healthy subject, stimulation in the frontal area, prefrontal area, even in healthy subjects, may increase the planning, emotion, judgment. Also, stimulation of the association area so either sensory association area or visual association area or digital association will overcome different logical problems as different perceptual disorders, right and left discrimination, somatoagnosia, perceptual deficits, apraxia, different neurological problems can be overcome through central stimulation. Actually, it is very important to differentiate firstly the difference between central stimulation and the peripheral stimulation. Central stimulation goes through the pathway of the pyramidal tract. It's either the stimulation in whatever area, motor area four, it goes with the pathway of the pyramidal from the area four to coronary radiata, internal capsule, midbrain, bones, matala, until reach to the anterior cells. This is one of the way of the central stimulation. Also, if it is corticospinal or even if it is corticobulbar, 
stimulation either of the lower part of the motor area four through the cortical barber connection and also through the coronary data to the internal capsule to the mid brain bones and the medulla stimulate different areas of the brain and they lead to dramatic response, especially the lower part of the motor area is responsible for the bulbar functions. So different bulbar manifestation as dysphagia, dysarsa, and horsen of voice can be treated and different studies also in this area. The next one is also, this is what's called central. Either from the central stimulation is the connection with the extrapyramidal. You different studies also were done on the extrapyramidal system, stimulation of different center, starting from area six, substantia, nigerous, subsalamic nuclei, red nucleus, and the different extrapyramidal centers through the uh, tick to spinal, reticular spinal, visible spinal, through all this bus we all to, we also we can excite the extra brain system and to control different uh, neurological problems uh, as as uh, tremors, uh, bradykinesia, some other uh, extra brain conditions also can be managed. This is what is called the, the center stimulation. What is the peripheral stimulation? Peripheral stimulation go from the sensory input to the motor output, start from the receptors, whatever the receptors, response or pain, touch, temperature, deep sensation, and to go and ascend with the spinosalamic tract and the gracile and the cuneate tract to reach to the most central gyrus of area three and one and two. This, most of the physical therapy techniques depend on the peripheral stimulation. Prolonged stretch technique, prolonged icing, tapping, approximation, traction, quick stretch, electrical stimulation, all these techniques depend on the sensor. The new technique which I'm talking about it in this lecture is central stimulation. Actually, central stimulation, there are two different types of central stimulation. Either neurosurgical, what is called invasive technique, and the non-surgical, which is physical therapy technique, which is called non-invasive technique. The invasive technique is a neurosurgical procedure through application of the electrical current to modify the brain function, and also is a very technique, a very old technique, mentioned more than 200 years ago, systematic animal studies in rats demonstrated that weak direct current delivered by the intracerebral or epidural electrodes induced cortical, activity, induced cortical activity and excitability or enhances which can be stable long after the end of the stimulation. Also, subsequent studies revealed that the long-lasting effects are protein senses dependent and accompanied by modification of intracellular cyclic adenosine monophosphate and calcium levels. Okay, this is one of the method of central stimulation uh, through electric stimulation delivered to the targeted area and the selection of the brain signals and the recording system for this stimulation. Salamic stimulation is also one of the invasive procedures known within the central salamus actively vulnerable to disconnection and dysfunction following severe brain, brain injuries because of the unique geometry of cerebral connection. This is what is called the, non, the invasive through implantation, implantation of electrodes inside the area which we need through uh, 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 surgical interference which is invasive procedure. The alternative is the non-invasive, which is a physical therapy technique, which we, we told the details now, inshallah. Also, transmagnetic stimulation induces stimulation of the brain through magnetic field. And the magnetic field will induce electric current, 
which is stimulate also different areas of the brain according to the localization of the transmagnetic stimulation. Now, we are going to concentrate about physiotherapy central stimulation. Physiotherapy central stimulation, what is called, the first one is transcranial direct current stimulation. Transcranial direct current stimulation is a non-invasive and debilitating brain stimulation that uses direct electrical currents to stimulate specific parts of the brain. A constant low intensity current is passed through two electrodes placed over the head which modulate in neural activity. Types of stimulation, there are two types of stimulation. Either a nodal stimulation is a positive stimulation that increases the neuronal excitability of the area being stimulated, or cathodal stimulation is a negative stimulation that decreases neural activity of the area being stimulated. It is used to treat psychological disorders that are caused by hyperactivity of the area of the brain. So, if there is hyperexcitability, we can modulate it through the cathodal. If there is lack of the cortical life, we can stimulate it through the cathodal stimulation. Mechanical action of transcranial direct current stimulation, transcranial direct current stimulation is based on the application of a weak direct current to the scalp via two relatively large anodes and the cathode. During the transcranial direct current stimulation, low amplitude direct current stimulation penetrates the skull because the bone is highly conducting to electric switch. This is very important basic neurophenomena. So low amplitude direct current stimulation penetrates the skull to enter the brain. Although there is substantial shunting of current in the scalp, sufficient current penetrates the brain to modify the transmembrane neuronal potential. Thus, influences the level of excitability and demodulates the firing rate of individual neurons. Transcranial direct current stimulation protocols generally involve the application of two surface electrodes, one serving as the anode and the other as the cathode. One milliampere to one two milliampere direct current is applied for up to 20 minutes between two electrodes placed on the scalp. The current flow from the anode to the cathode, some being diverted through the scalp and some moving through the brain and lead to increase or decrease in cortical excitability, depending on the direction and the intensity of the current. So, anodal transcranial direct current stimulation typically has an excitatory effect on the local cerebral cortex by depolarizing in neuron while the converse apply under the casut through the process of hyperpolarization. In relation to electrode size, increasing the size of the reference electrode and reducing the size of the stimulation electrode allow for more focal treatment effects. Therapeutic uses of transcranial direct current stimulation. Chronic pain of central origin, which include migraine, fibromyalgia, painful neuropathies as alcoholic neuropathy, and the complex regional pain syndrome, which is called the CRIPS, which is the reflex sympathetic dystrophy, which one of the major problems resulted from different neurological and orthopedic problems. Also, the psychiatric condition, which responded to transcranial direct stimulation, includes treatment resistant depression. It is now considered one of the first line of treatment for depression. First line of treatment of, of depression. With the medical, with the antidepressive treatment, bipolar disorders, addiction, borderline personality disorders, schizophrenia, and hallucination. Neurological disorders improved by transcranial direct stimulation include tinnitus, epilepsy, stroke, insomnia, age-related cognitive decline, and the dementia. Okay, transcranial direct stimulation and the chronic neuropathic pain. This is the explanation. For please, يعني for the time, I, I uh, inshallah to go to the method, the mode of stimulation. Uh, now next, safety of the transcranial, which is very important point. Transcranial therapy is very safe. The reaction which may be reduced just itching in the skin, 
and the redness and the some headache. So you can use transcranial direct stimulation safe. The, the, the very important point. The second point is in measurement. The subject is seated comfortably. The area of stimulation will be found through the measurement of the scalp. Usually the convention of the EEG, very important to know, that is called a stent 20 system, which is used for electroencephalography to define the different areas of the brain. And the localization of the vertex through measuring the distance of the nesion to the anion and also measure the distance between the preauricular points as this figure shows, that this localization is very important to apply. This is what is called a 10 to 20 system, which is very important to localize the site of stimulation. Also, it, this is a, a history of the first device which is used for, electric, for direct current stimulation. Now, the device is available. It is small than your in iPhone. You can put it in your pocket, and you can even receive stimulation with walking and even treadmill or bicycle and so on. There is no problem at all. Even now, there is home-based devices which can be applied at home without any problem at all. This is about, okay, the last uh, minute. This is the, the past history of galvanic. This is the first trial, 1995, to start the central stimulation, and uh, this is the device which is used, and uh, تقريباً لحد علمي على وجه هذه الأرض. ده كان أول ما استخدم فيه. سو ليتر أون دخلنا في سباينا ستيميليشن ثم الترانسكرينيال دايركتر ستيميليشن اكسكوز مي ذا تايم از فيري ليمتد ثانك يو فيري ماتش شكرا. Okay, so we're going to start with the questions now. Anyone has a question for Dr. Majdi? Excuse me, Dr. Majdi. Uh, what about uh, the application of transcranial electric nerve in, uh, uh, stimulation in cases of cerebral palsy in the, and in pediatric? Actually, I supervised one study in pediatric school in cerebral palsy. It's in a spastic diabetic uh, cerebral palsy. Spastic diabetic cerebral palsy. Still, it is a promising, and the future re research must go in this area for to ensure the results and to ensure the out function outcome. It need actually more research and more application in pediatric scope or field. And uh, what about the complication and side effect like uh, seizure and uh, epilepsy? It's a very important point. Transcranial direct transmission in itself don't evoke epilepsy, didn't evoke epilepsy. But if the patient already has epileptic fits, it is one of the contraindication. But in, in itself, transcranial direct transmission didn't evoke at all epileptic fits. One also of the precaution in pediatric, the patient, uh, infant with shunt operation, also during uh, uh, some uh, after uh, surgical procedure, or if there is implantation of any metal part in the brain, there is, it is one of the contraindications to apply transcranial direct kind of stimulation. Are there any previous study discussed the relation between uh, neural plasticity and the transcranial? Yes, actually, the, the transcranial direct stimulation depends mainly to hasten the process of neural plasticity yes. to increase the recovery and hasten the recovery. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Any other questions? Any other questions? Okay. I just have a comment, Dr. Majdi. Thanks. First of all, it's a great, uh, great uh, topic that we uh, discussing now. We know that uh, uh, neuro neuro stimulation it's uh, in its infancy right now. Most of the research are done or in animal studies. Uh, when it comes to neuroplasticity, your question, Dr. Akram, there's a big studies now, they uh, emphasize on neuroplasticity and cardiovascular uh, uh, activities. So technically, if we have the patient uh, doing an intensive cardiac output, 
that showed to be enhance, enhancing neuroplasticity, and that's something that we, in the very recent uh, studies. However, we all believe that the near future, most of the studies, when it comes to neurostimulation, uh, is going to be, uh, you know, it's going to be more uh, evident, and we look forward to that. So thank you so much, Dr. Mejdi, for your, uh, for, uh, for your presentation, and uh, we move along right now to uh, Ms. Ahlam al -Mutayri. Ms. Ahlam is a senior DPT student at the College of Medical Rehabilitation. The work she is presenting is research work carried out along with Amna and, Le uh, and Lema al asaf under the supervision of Dr. Abdul Ghannam. Ahlam al -Mutayri has always been at top of her class with a unique personality and uh, endorsing enthusiasm. She's also known for her hard work and strong determ uh, determ uh, determination. You can go ahead. You have, you have uh, uh, 15 minutes with five minutes of questions. You can start. Thank you. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah. Before we start, please raise your hand if you ever heard about peripheral arterial disease. Anyone? Okay. Um, that's about 20% of the room. <laughs> okay, okay. There's one here. Okay. Okay. So, so, for those who never heard about peripheral arterial disease, it's a progressive atherosclerotic disease caused by deposition of fat in the inner wall of artery. That's resulting in narrowing the blood passage and decreasing the amount of blood that go for the lower extremity. It affects more than 200 million of people globally. It is common in people who is older than 50 years with one or more cardiovascular risk factor. It often goes under diagnosis because of its asymptomatic natures and lack of the disease prevalence, both in public and medical community. If not detected and treated early, it will, lead to, it will negatively affect the quality of life, leading to a progressive functional impairment. It will lead to limb loss, heart attack, and even a stroke. In fact, the prevalence of cerebrovascular disease in those who have a bad uh, are higher than 50 years. Um, while coronary artery disease in those patients ranging from 11 to 71%, compared to those who have um, without bad, ranging from 5 to 45 percent. The patient will be at higher risk if they are, if they ha uh, if they are a smoker or have a long-standing diabetes. Also, if they have a hypertension, high cholesterol level, obesity, and family history of cerebrovascular disease. Um, also, smoking and diabetes show the strongest association. And in fact, as the, uh, several, uh, as the risk factor coexists, the severity will increase several fold. Here, the overall course of the disease. Actually, the majority of the patients will be asymptomatic. They will experience no symptom. And the most common symptom is intermittent claudication, which defined as aching pain or cramping the patient feel in the leg and the foot, which is triggered by a very uh, distance walking or by exercising and relieved by rest. As the disease progress, the patient will start to have a pain in resting. And the most common feature in this stage, the patients always prefer to sleep in sitting position because of the effect of the gravity. And in the later stage, the patient will have a, a critical limb ischemia, which is a broad term to describe those who have a, a poor healing wound, they have foot ulcers, and gangrene. Uh, actually, the PAD is most common in those who, have, who are diabetes. And diabetes is usually accompanied by peripheral neuropathy with impaired sensory feedback. So they mostly not present with a classical symptom of intermittent claudications. Um, those patients are more prone to have a sudden ischemia of arterial thrombosis leading to a critical limb ischemia and a higher risk of amputation. In fact, more than 50% of lower limb amputation are performed in diabetic patients. For these, they, there are significant uh, costs of health, uh, of, uh, there, there is a significant economic cost in healthcare, reducing the productivity and the personal expenses associated with a chronic manifestation of PAD. Here, the ankle brachial index, which is the gold standard for non-invasive measurement for diagnosing a peripheral arterial disease. It is an objective evaluation. It has a sensitivity of 
70 to, uh, to 95 percent and specificity of 95 to 100 percent. It is perceived as a specialist test. It needs a specific training program to perform the entire procedure for the ankle brachial index without mistake. Most clinical would not able to perform the whole procedure correctly. So what we will need to perform the ankle brachial index? We need a handheld Doppler with a probe of 8 megahertz, a proper size cuff, finger manometers, ultrasound gel, a pen and an ABI chart. So for performing the procedure, the patient will need to rest for at least 10 minutes. Then we will apply a cuff of appropriate size around the, the arms. Then we'll try to, uh, to palpate the brachial pulses, if we can palpate it. If we can't, we'll, uh, we'll be put a gel, and we'll put a prop at a 60-degree uh, angle. Okay. Then we will, take, we will take the blood pressure, as we do in traditional ways. So we start to inflate until the cessation of a blood flow, and then we'll record a systolic blood pressure. And we will do the same measurement for the contralateral brachial arteries. Can you proceed? So we will take also the measurement from the ankle for both dorsalis pedius and the posterior tibial artery. If we can palpate, we will use palpation to identify the site of pulses. If we can't, we will apply a gel and use the prop for identification of the pulses. And here, this prop is a part of device which is called a handheld doubler. This device consists of two parts. The prop which provides us with the sounds, and the other part uh, provides us with a chart of the waveform. So the aim of our study is to determine whatever the handheld doubler alone is sufficient to, uh, to diagnose those who have a peripheral arterial disease or not. So pack for an API. So if we want to take the right side, the right leg, ABI. So what we need, we need to take a highest pressure from both dorsalis pedius and posterior tibial artery. We will measure the both systolic blood pressures, and then we will take the higher one. Then divide it by the highest pressure in both arms. The lower the result, the more obstruction you have. So the normal value here, if you have zero, from 0 0.9 to 1.29. If you have a higher result, you have a non-compressible arteries, which is in case of uh, if there's a calcification of arteries. The more the, um, the, more the result, the more severe you have the peripheral arterial disease. Okay, proceed. So for the limitation, the most commonly uh, reported limitation for the gold standard, the ankle brachial index, it takes more time to perform. It needs a specific, uh, it needs a trained practitioner to perform. Uh, there is also lack of reimbursement and the financial cost, also the uh, equipment and availability. So for the method, it's a validation study. The patient will be, uh, the participant will be included if they are age of over 65 years old, if they are more than 50 years with a history of diabetes or smoking, if they have intermittent claudication. They will be ex excluded in case of non-compressible vessels, DVT, recent bypass graft, and previous amputation. And these are the, the contraindication for performing a Lanker brachial index. Uh, 54 participants will be enrolled in this study. They will be divided into two groups. The first group will undergo a handheld doubler first, followed by an ankle brachial index. The second group will undergo for ankle brachial index followed by handheld doubler. And this is the counterbalancing to overcome the effect of orders. So for the study protocol, the, the participant will be asked to refrain from smoking, physical activity, and caffeine beverage at least two hours before performing the measurement. The measurement will be taken at 9 a.m. at a thermoneutral uh, temperatures with a, one trained practitioner, and the patient will be asked to rest for at least 10 minutes. And here, the, uh, it's the recording form for the ankle brachial index. Uh, all the risk factors will, will be recorded, also the patient symptom and all the measurements obtained. And here, the handheld doubler, as we say previously, there is a probe which provides us with the sounds, and also uh, the device screening. A screen will provide us with the waveforms. 
For the waveforms, a normal will be considered triphasic and biphasic, and it's abnormal in case if it's uh, monophasic. And here the recording form for the handheld doubler. So, uh, so we use a G power for estimating the, uh, the total sample size. Planned element plot will be used to assess an agreement between the two methods. And the ROC, ROC analysis will be performed to describe the relationship between sensitivity and the specificity of both devices. A statistical analysis will be performed using the SPSS. So, for the results, recently we take the ethical approval, but we have a limitation. There is no trained practitioner in, in King Saud Hospital or at Al Qasim region who is able to perform the ankle brachial index. So, per our knowledge, there is a nurse, certified nurse actually, in King Faisal Hospital. Uh, she is uh, certified with performing the ankle brachial index, and we will try to contact her if she can perform the procedure or train another nurse to perform the procedure. And that is all. We are ready for your questions. <laughs> Any questions? Okay, thank you. It's not a question as more it is a thank you to you all. Um, conflict of interest, they are my students, so um, I have to say this before I begin. I, I really thank you for getting the ethical approval done because it was a long process uh, and they achieved it and you should make a big deal about, out of it. It is okay? a big deal. Yeah, so you should, you should say this really when you mention it that it was a hard journey to get the ethical approval and you had it. Uh, thank you for that. Um, and clearly you can see uh, how you developed when it comes to uh, research design, when it comes to how you perform sample size estimation and those things. Uh, extremely proud of you and keep going. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Ahlam and Amna, for your outstanding presentation. Uh, we're going to move along now to uh, Ms. Rawan Rashid. Ms. Rawan Rashid is a DPT student at the College of Medical Rehabilitation. The research work is carried out under the supervision of Dr. Mohammed uh, Sayed Khalil. So please welcome Rawan. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Rawan Rashid, Khrijat al Bismillah. Uh, my research talk about the effect of kinetic tape. The effect of kinetic tape in Bell's palsy to improve facial functions. Bell's palsy is a type of facial paralysis that results in inability to control the facial muscle on affected side. A symptom can vary, can vary from mild to severe. They may, uh, they may include muscle twitching, weak, weakness, or total loss of ability to move one or rarely but side of the face. Other symptoms include drooping of the eyelid, change in test, pain around the air, and increased sensitivity to sound. Typically, symptoms come in over 48 hours. Kinesiotape is a relative new technique used in rehabilitation program to reduce the pain, control joint instability, assist with posture alignment, to promote circulation and healing, and relax overuse muscle. The use of kinesiotaping method in physiotherapy of peripheral nerve, nervous system damage is a new and effective therapeutic option. In rehabilitation, taping is popular in intervention for treatment and prevention of many musculoskeletal disorder. For Bill's palsy, when applied to the affected side of the face to facilitate the movement and improve the symmetry of the face. A statement of a problem. This study will be conducted to answer the research question. Is kinesiotaping a movable function of face muscles? 
purpose of study, the aim of this study was to investigate the effect of, of kinesio tape to facilitate the movement and improve the function of the face. Significance of study, facial asymmetry can lead to physical dysfunction, social disability, fundamental change, and self-concept and decrease the functional participation. Kinesio tape has been utilized for neuromuscular education in other contexts to address tone regulation, alignment, and proper reception. This research explains how functional corrective kinesio tapping technique can, can, can be applied to the face as a neuromuscular treatment for facial asymmetry. <coughs> Hypothesis, no significant effect of kinesio tape in the treatment moderate pulse, pulse, moderate pulse, pulse and the moral function and symmetry of the face. Delimitation. The study will include patients who have moderate pulse palsy in subacute face. For patients of female and male with age range from 20 to 50 years old will participate in this study. Limitation, cooperation patient, cultural restriction, psychological aspect, small sample size. The material method. Inclusion criteria and an age will be range from 20 to 50 years, uh, with subacute pulse palsy, moderate pulse palsy, with outpatient, no other neurological defect. Uh, exclusion criteria, upper motor neural lesion, diabetic patient, pregnant woman, patient with allergy reaction to kinesio tape. The uh, many hospital in the same region. Uh, evaluation tool, the ba all patients were evaluated by using house breakman score before treatment and after using kinesio tape. Treatment, to uh, treatment tool, the kinesio tape. The assessment of facial uh, movement according to house breakman and then uh, this one, this schedule of house breakman include six grade. Uh, our result considered 40 patients, 70 percent were female, and 30 percent were male, with age range from 20 years to 50. The patients participated in this study were classified randomly into two groups of equal number. Group A include 20 pulse pulse patients, six male and 14 female. All age group ranged from 20 to 50 years. This group received traditional physical therapy program in addition received kinesio tape of affected side. Group B include 20 pulse palsy patient for male and 16, 16 female. All age group range from 20 to 50 years. This group received traditional physical therapy program only. Patient of a group received the previous physical therapy program in addition kinesio tape. Kinesio tape was applied at the affected side of the face. A technique by <coughs> applied by from origin to insertion was chosen to assist in muscle contraction. Those facilitate and improve strength. A technique is the whole X shape. Uh, ethical consideration, research conform of ethical principle, uh, medical research, written assist was obtained from a patient. And then the mean value of brief treatment of facial function, the <coughs> b-value of life, non-significant. The mean value of pre and post treatment for both group in uh, A and B, the uh, b-value is not significant. We will see the difference in group A, of course, in group B. The mean value of post treatment, same before. Uh, the study aimed to present kinesio tapping as one of the method of influencing <coughs> the improvement of the functional state in patients with damaged facial nerve. We believe that to support the effect of physiotherapy and damage to the peripheral nervous system, sensory interaction is helpful using kinesio tape batch. Underlying mechanism of kinesio tape, when kinesio tape is applied correctly to the skin over injured area, the lymphatic fissure can dilatate open, allowing the drainage of excess, excess fluid away from the area. Further reduce the pressure on the blood vessel and pain receptor. As blood flow improves, the enhanced delivery of oxygen and nutrient 
to the injury, the injury tissue accelerate the healing process. Kinesiotape has been graded individually to the patient. The patient ex experienced the treatment with kinesiotape as, as positive and without discomfort. A treatment with kinesiotape can be used as supplement to the physical therapy in relation, in relation to <coughs> in relation to actual, actual neurological patient with facial palsy. The treatment can be used when uh, it's applied compensatory for lost muscle function, also was experienced when it helped independently to perform meaningful activity. Similar study, طبعاً هذه similar study كانت Polish language باللغة البولندية وتكنيك مختلف اللي هو Y shape. Similar study on the application of kinesiotape after facial nerve <coughs> reconstruction show improvement in face symmetry and tongue muscle movement. The use of kinesiotape in patients with damaged facial nerve fill out the kinesiotape is not just effective set therapy tool, but a new look at physiotherapy, aim at support process self-healing of the body, not their replacement. Furthermore, kinesiotape reported to be Benefical in trigeminal nerve area. A trigeminal neuralgia is pain. To apply the tape correctly, the, ex the skin must be stretched as much as possible. The tape is applied from medial to lateral side without using a stretch. After a short period of time, there should be notable pain relief. Kinesio tabbing is a technique that allows therapists to work one on, sorry, on more functional activity through through improved, improved position, further study provides significant effect of applying kinesiotape over wrist, wrist extensor muscle jointly with physical therapy program in children recover from herb palsy. The technique by which the tape was applied from origin to insertion was chosen to assist the muscle contraction, thus facilitate and improve the strength. Uh, this study suggests they use kinesiotape method in physiotherapy of peripheral nervous system damage, a new and effective therapeutic option. We are recommend to use of kinesiotape method as main treatment in Bill's palsy because this study was to investigate the effect of kinesiotape to facilitate the movement and the durable function of the face. Thank you. <laughs> Any question? Thank you, Rowan. Uh, you mentioned that uh, the application of kinesio tape from origin to insertion. What I understood and I revised it now that the origin starts here, the insertion here. So we have to reverse the first no. policy. How this? Uh, no, when apply when apply kinesiotape, I take cor a lot of course on kinesiotape. When apply kinesiotape, uh, we apply we do in origin to insertion, but when apply opposite opposite side, from angle of the mouth to. You head. said on the affected side. Yes. <laughs> Any other question? Yes, yes, doctor. Okay. Uh, in the selection of your uh, patients, you said that there is a moderate pulse palsy. Yes. Uh, who, how you would you define a moderate pulse palsy? In house pregnancy score. Yes. Range from the range depend on depend on phase one and grade one and grade four, two. Uh -huh. This one. Uh, <coughs> Not moderate, it's a uh, simple bell's palsy. And grade three. How we can detect it is a moderate or severe or. Uh, yes, from how to break this score. The score. Mm. Can you mention the score? No. Mm. The scale. Oh. Mm. 
which one we can decide grade, that this is three, middle, am, am I yes, or moderate? Grade, uh, grade three and four, moderate pulse palsy. Moderate pulse palsy. Yani I didn't, uh, yani I, 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 couldn't, I couldn't uh, appreciate this, uh, mm. this uh, pinch. And the grade five and six severe pulse palsy. This is for facial movement. How you decide this is a moderate pulse pulse? Yes, when patient, when uh, after assessment, when patient take a grade, for example, three mm -hmm. or four, this is moderate pulse pulse. Uh, you must uh, mention yes. that this okay. is a simple, this is a moderate, this is a severe, not just grading. Oh. Okay. Uh, uh, my uh, question also in your recommendations, you said that uh, mm -hmm. the kinesio step must be considered as a mean treatment, yes. which I consider it is not a mean. It is one part of the treatment. Yes, of we course. can't, uh, uh, the expression mean is, uh, is very. <laughs> no, I mean add to program. Add, uh, mean, yes. it's add too to aggressive program. to make a mean treatment. No, no. This is no a mean no, treatment. of course not uh, only kinesio only tape. Not. Okay, okay. Just thank you. Add it to program. Uh, yes, thank you. Any other questions? Uh, thanks for uh, uh, the great presentation. I was interested. Uh, just I have uh, one question. Uh, why you exclude uh, the pregnant and the diabetic patient from the study? Uh, diabetic because uh, any maybe uh, results uh, take long time. And the pregnant maybe just for uh, be comfortable when you use kinesio tape to any pregnant. Just that. I just want to comment uh, regarding uh, the house Brackman. This mm. uh, test uh, is very reliable uh, test used uh, for patients with facial palsy. And there is another one we use in our hospital, which is called uh, um, Sony, Bro uh, Sony Brook uh, Facial Grading System. Is uh, also very reliable as uh, ha house Brackman, mm -hmm. uh, but it's more sensitive for change uh, over time. So okay. thank you. Thank you. At which muscle you apply the kinesio tapping? Uh, many muscles, zygomatic muscle, uh, orbicularis oris, and uh, buccinator. Uh, and what about the duration of application? Uh, because kinesio tape for facilitating, for facilitate the muscle, I use for three hours, maximum. Yeah, but uh, uh, when you mention that is that motivate uh, pelvis palsy. Mm. Uh, and the recovery, we, you didn't uh, uh, clarify it is uh, a new apraxia, axontomesis, neurotomesis. Okay, which type of, uh, of uh, pelvis palsy, which type of, uh, of uh, peripheral facial nerve lesion? Uh, have you any, uh, how can you classify the patient, okay, to detect that the improvement uh, or the delay of improvement due to the degree of the initial uh, uh, injury to the nerve or due to the uh, what new technique of treatment? Uh, actually, I, uh, I say I for uh, kinesis. You understand? Yes, you yes. Und uh, nerve vision, we have new plexia, axon mm. and new mesis. Mm. Okay, how can you classify the patient and uh, detect the uh, selective criteria and the exclusion criteria? Mm. Have you uh, any uh, test before? applying the procedure to qualify that we will apply on a new practice here? No. So I think that this is the type of the, the point of limitation because it, some, it may you have a patient uh, with new practice here, excellent means according to the severity. Uh, so you classify it according to the functional only. Mm -hmm. Functional according to your scale, the moderate according to the asymmetry. Okay, but uh, actually in Bellis Palsy, the improvement according to the severity of the lesion. So we have a patient like, like neoplexia, mm -hmm. uh, uh, with, uh, he, he may recover without any intervention. Within few weeks, may uh, have a spontaneous recovery. Another patient may uh, l uh, take about uh, six months, and another patient may have a residual uh, asymmetry between both sides. So I think that this study is very good, and I want to thank you about uh, your effort. But we have to detect. The, the case and make a, a, a selection criteria. Mm -hmm. This patient is only neopraxia. 
okay, um, is uh, according to uh, certain evaluation. Okay, according to what is the type of, uh, the cause of initial, uh, the causes of the previous pulse. Okay, then we can add the kinesiotab as uh, like your recommendation as a, a, a main uh, element of a the physiotherapy treatment uh, in the patient of the program of the patient with uh, pulse pulse. We have a lot of techniques for pulse pulse, but I think that, okay, until now we can't uh, take the decision that in the kinesiotab can be considered as one of the chief element of physiotherapy intervention. Mm -hmm. And again, thank you for your great effort. Thank you. بس حابة أنوه النقطة إنه بعد استخدام الكينيزيو تاب كل المرضى بدون مبالغة قالوا إنه الفيدنج عندهم مبروف السليتيشن ديكريز يعني في بوزيتيف حتى من البيشنت. Of course, of course, I appreciate your effort, but because we have our student now with us, okay, and we talk about before about the evidence based. The, the attitude of physiotherapy toward the evidence base. Yeah. So now we talk about evidence base. When I talk about evidence base, we have to take the, your, 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 your results and to add it to my curriculum to give uh, uh, information to my study. So we talk about this point. I think that your recommendation, we need more study. Yes, we need course. more study. Yes. More study that include uh, the I new facts, the more, uh, more objective uh, examination and uh, test. Thanks. Uh, Thank you. Okay. Okay. Because we have the time limit, but go ahead. Okay, we're going to have a last comment from uh, Dr. Mirzi. Yeah, yeah. yeah, I'm completely confused, Dr. Again, uh, Dr. Asahan and Dr. Akram, usual in this studies, we use two measures, functional one, and the uh, uh, objective one as nerve conduction velocity or EMG. It is yes. very important either to detect the first, it is mild or middle or severe, and also for follow up yes. for this condition. Yes. Yes. I think right. that uh, it is not, uh, this is considered to solve the problem, right. either the question of Dr. Sahar or also your comments. Thank you very much. Okay, so on this note, we're going to end uh, session two of uh, uh, the uh, research and the topics. Thank you to everyone who participated today in the talk, and thank you all for participating. And now we're going to move to the closing session uh, in a minute. Thank you so much. So, بانتهائنا اليوم بنختم اللي هو الملتقى البحثي الثالث. أولاً أود أن أشكر معالي مدير الجامعة على رعايته المنتدى البحثي الثالث لكلية التأهيل الطبي. وشكر موصول لسعادة الأستاذ الدكتور أحمد التركي على افتتاح اليوم للملتقى وتشريفه. 
فإنابة عن نفسي وعن عميدة الكلية للتأهيل الطبي وعمداء الكلية نشكركم جميعا على حضوركم وأما الطالبات التي شاركوا في يوم البحثي فرسالة بسيطة نحن فخورين فيكم جدا اليوم في عندنا فوق ال 37 بوستر الآن عرض اليوم يعتبر أول خطوة أخذتوها تو ريبريزنت ولا لي آه لتمثيل الكلية أمام الجامعة وحصاد مجهودكم كاملا مع في المجهود البحثي أمام الجامعة هذه خطوة إن شاء الله للأمام المتبقى إن شاء الله والمأمول أن يكون مستوى تمثيلكم أعلى من أعلى من فقط من تمثيل الكلية بل يكون على مستوى الجامعة ويكون تمثيلكم بإذن الله على محافل محلية تحمل اسم الجامعة وبإذن الله محافل دولية تحمل اسم الجامعة والمملكة العربية السعودية ختاما أحب أشكر جميع الحضور جميع المشاركين اليوم وجميع الطالبات والسلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته معليش لحد يطلع باقي جائزة الحين إذا ما عليكم أمر